Sri Lanka is a 65,000 square kilometer island below the southern tip of India and situated in the Indian Ocean. It has been known as the Pearl of the Indian Ocean from early times. It has a recorded history of over 2,500 years and definite information about its form of government is available from the 3rd century BC in the Anuradhapura period. In ancient times, the head of state was the king and Sri Lanka was a monarchy. The king was also entrusted with the legislative functions. He presided over a court of ministers who represented the interests of the people and advised the king. In the 4th century BC, King Pandukhabe made Anuradhapura the first capital of Sri Lanka in a manner we consider modern. The forerunner to the parliament, the royal court, met in the evening to discuss municipal matters under a different official called Nagaraguttika. During the 5th century, the royal court met in a special place presided over by the king. During the Purannarua period, a special beautiful building was constructed by King Parakramabahu for the royal court to meet. King Nisankamal, who followed him, built his own royal court close to the waters of the Parakrama Samudra Reservoir. This tradition has been followed in Kandy, the last kingdom of the Sinhalese, where an artificial lake was created close by. The maritime districts fell to the Portuguese in 1505. Then came the Dutch in 1602. And the last bastion of the Sinhalese, the Kandyan kingdom, was taken over by the British in 1815 with the signing of the Kandyan Convention. However, just three years later, the British administration was disrupted due to a rebellion by the Sinhalese. As a result, the Colebrook Commission was appointed in 1833 to introduce reforms. According to its recommendations, the two separate councils, the Executive Council and the Legislative Council, were formed. At the beginning, both legislative and executive councils met at the building of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in front of Gordon Gardens in the Colombo Fort. The governor was the president of the legislative council which had nine official members and six unofficial members who were nominated by the governor consisting of three Europeans and one each from the Sinhala, Tamil and Burger communities. In 1912, the number of members increased to 21. In 1921, it increased to 37. In 1924, it was further increased to 49. This was followed by the appointment of the Donamore Commission. Based on its recommendations, the universal franchise for all adults over the age of 21 was introduced in 1931 and the name Legislative Council was changed to the State Council which consisted of 61 members. A 12-acre block near Golface was selected for a parliamentary building and a design of architect Woodson was accepted. It was opened ceremonially by Sir Herbert Stanley on January 1930. 
Sir Stanley, in his address, said that he believed that the people will protect the independence and the dignity of this building. The Solbury Commission, which was appointed in 1944, recommended a package of reforms in 1946 based on the Westminster model. Accordingly, the Parliament consisted of the Senate, or Upper House, and the House of Representatives, or Lower House. The Senate had 30 members and the House of Representatives 101, out of which 95 members were elected and six were nominated by the Governor-General. The Prime Minister and the Cabinet were answerable to the Lower House. Sri Lanka achieved independence from Britain on the 4th of February 1948 with Dominion status. The head of the state was the Governor-General representing the Queen of Great Britain. Right Honourable D.S. Senanayaka became the first Prime Minister. From 1948 till the present, Right Honourable D.S. Senanayaka, Dudley Senanayaka, Sir John Kotalavala, S.W.R.D. Bandaranayaka, Dr. Vijayananda Dahanayaka, Mrs. Sirimavo Bandaranayaka, J.R. Jayavardhana and R. Premadasa, D.B. Vijayatunga, Ranil Vikramasinghe, Mrs. Chandrika Bandaranayaka Kumarathunga, Ratnasiri Vikramanayaka and Mahinda Rajapaksha served as Prime Ministers. Of them, J.R. Jayavardhana, R. Premadasa, D.B. Vijayathunga, Mrs. Chandrika Bandaranayaka Kumarathunga and Mahinda Rajapaksha have been elected Executive Presidents. Prior to them, Sir Oliver Gunadilaka and Mr. William Gopallava held the position of Governor General of the country. In 1972, Sri Lanka became a republic with the adoption of a new constitution. According to this constitution, the legislature or the National State Assembly had only one house with 168 elected representatives. On the 7th of September 1978, the second republican constitution of Sri Lanka, the constitution of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka was enacted. The special features of the constitution were the elections by proportional representation and the executive presidency. The number of members was 225, out of which 29 were appointed from the national lists of members from parties and the independent groups that contested. The parliament is a supreme legislative authority of the country which has a life of six years. The Parliament can be summoned, prorogued and dissolved by a proclamation by the President. The life of the Parliament may be extended by a constitutional amendment passed with a two-thirds majority and a referendum. Parliament has four main functions such as lawmaking, scrutiny of the executive, ventilation of public grievances through public petitions and questions in Parliament and the control of public finance through the Public Accounts Committee and the Committee on Public Enterprises. As the Gaulface Parliament building was inadequate, the House permitted in 1979 the building of a new Parliament in Sri Javardhanapura Korte. The Korte Kingdom, which was established by Nisanka Alakeshwara or Nisanka Alagokonara in the 14th century and later another distinguished King Parakramabaho VI made it his capital. The sacred tooth relic was deposited in this kingdom of Sri Javardhanapura Korte. It was a famous and beautiful city described in the chronicle Salalini Sandeshe written by the venerable Totagamwe Sri Rahul Athero. This parliament at Sri Javadnanapura Korte was the third building after the Legislative Council was established in 1833. With the opening of the new parliament, Sri Javadnanapura Korte became the administrative capital of Sri Lanka. The new parliament was designed by the famous architect Geoffrey Bawa to be located on a beautiful 12-acre island in the historic Dewanna Lake. 10 kilometers away from the city of Colombo.
Under the standing orders, Parliament meets on two alternative weeks after the first and third Sunday of each month on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. The national flag is flown at full mast on the second floor of the Parliament building facing the ceremonial drive to signify that Parliament is sitting. If the meeting goes on beyond 6.30 p.m., a lantern, amber in colour, atop the flagstaff shines in place of the national flag to indicate that Parliament is still at work. The building, which spreads over 48,000 square metres, reflects the historic Panchawasa or the fivefold historic buildings of Sri Lanka, as designs were based on indigenous traditions. Its doorways from all sides have unique, beautiful creations in art. The entrance to the building is through a clump of ironwood trees. The ironwood, or na, is the national tree of Sri Lanka. Immediately afterwards, one comes across the national flower, the manel, or the blue lotus. Beyond this pond is the entrance to the foyer that leads to the chamber. Beyond the foyer is a special ceremonial area of the parliament. Visible on either side of the foyer are two large ornamental bells, which were gifted to parliament by Mitsui Construction Company of Japan. The ceiling has been decorated by the work of the famous artist Mrs. Ina de Silva. In the middle of the foyer, is a folding bronze door which protects the pair of gates made of iron and silver behind which is the entrance to the main chamber. The wall between the main door and the entrance to the chamber is covered with exquisite murals created by the artist Dr. Manjusri. These are unique traditional paintings depicting gods and goddesses mentioned in the epic the Salalini Sandesha. Inscribed on the door of the chamber is the preamble to the constitution of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka in Sinhala, in Tamil and in English. This has been done in a style similar to ancient stone inscriptions. This masterpiece has been done by the metal sculptor Vimal Surendra. At the entrance of the speaker's gallery is a unique painting by the well-known artist Seneca Senanayaka. The members of parliament, the staff and the public have their respective entrances situated on the ground floor. The members entrance on the east side is adorned by a mural carved in mahogany by Mahind Abhisekra and depicts a sylvan theme. The staff entrance situated on the west side is adorned by a mural depicting a marsh done by Anil Gamini Jayasurya. These two entrances lead to one corridor the walls of which are lined with photographs of members of parliament, both past and present. The centerpiece of the whole building is the chamber. Meticulous care has been lavished on this. It is a place of arresting beauty. It is rectangular in shape and occupies a height of two floors. Eighteen silver flags banners and standards of kings, temples and corales on ornamental stainless steel posts and seven foot tall insignia of Sri Lanka form a halo above the chamber, giving it dignity. A magnificent giant chandelier of beaten copper plated in silver hangs from the center of the roof directly beneath the suspended coffered ceiling, giving an oriental touch. This dazzling spectacle was designed and constructed by Lucky Senanayaka. The Speaker's Chair is a gift from the British House of Commons and is fashioned from a 200-year-old piece of pure English oak. This is made from a part of a beam of the House of Commons dislodged when it was partly destroyed during the Second World War. The chair, which is six feet in height, is upholstered in deep maroon and the Sinhala lion with drawn sword is embossed in gold on leather under the head of the chair. The Speaker is the most important person in Parliament and handles its most difficult tasks. He is the guardian of the rights and privileges of Parliament and the final authority on the interpretation of the rules of procedure. 
impartiality and fairness are his prime attributes and he is expected to disregard his own party identity during his term of office as speaker. The speaker is also responsible for the management of the parliamentary estate. He is elected by the House at its first meeting following a general election. The office of the speaker is considered as prestigious and is of great importance. He ranks third in the order of precedence next to the Prime Minister who comes immediately after the President. In the absence of the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker and in his absence, the Deputy Chairman of Committees presides. There is also a Chairman's Panel to assist the presiding officers. Below the Speaker's Chair are the Chairs of the Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General. The Secretary General is the advisor to the Speaker in matters relating to the exercise of all powers and functions that belong to the Speaker and to the House through the Speaker. He or she has to be present in the Chamber during the sittings of the House. The Secretary General's advice is available to all members irrespective of party affiliations and such advice is comprehensive, frank and completely impartial. The Secretary General, who is the head of the Staff of Parliament, is appointed by the President on the approval of the Constitutional Council. By virtue of his or her being the Secretary General, he or she functions as the Secretary to all Parliamentary Committees. Beyond the bar of the House, on either side, sits the Sergeant at Arms and his Deputy, who carries the mace when the Speaker enters the Chamber. The Sergeant at Arms is responsible for the maintenance of order within the premises and performs ceremonial functions. He is privileged to be allowed to wear a sword to indicate his authority to defend the Speaker and the Members of Parliament. On the right hand side of the Speaker are seats allocated to members of the governing party. On his left are the seats that belong to the opposition. The seating capacity is for 232 members. The first two rows of seats on the right hand side of the speaker are reserved for cabinet ministers. The eighth seat in the front row is occupied by the prime minister. The leader of the opposition sits directly opposite him. Just above the steps leading to the chamber from the main entrance is a long rectangular nickel band placed across the red carpeted floor of the well of the chamber. This marks the bar of the house. The face of the bar is engraved with intricate designs traditionally symbolic of intrepidity, perpetuity and prosperity. No one other than an elected representative is allowed to cross this bar except the Secretary General's staff who are attached to the chamber. In the upper portion of the chamber is a raised gallery for the public capable of seating 600 persons with standing accommodation for many more. Immediately opposite the speaker's chair is the speaker's gallery. This gallery is reserved for privileged visitors. The press is accommodated in the gallery above the speaker's chair. Quorum bells which ring out like the singing of a salalinia or a grackle are fixed in various parts of the building and these are activated from the speaker's table in his office and the secretary general's table in the chamber. Parliamentary sittings commence with the arrival of the speaker. The sergeant at arms leads the way carrying the mace, followed by the deputy sergeant at arms. A procession made up of the secretary general, his deputies and the speaker makes its way to the chamber. As soon as the Speaker enters the chamber, the Deputy Sergeant at Arms makes it known to everyone present that the Speaker has arrived. The Speaker occupies a special chair kept at a higher elevation. When the Parliament is in session, the mace is kept in the upper bracket on the Speaker's table. The mace, the symbol of authority of the Parliament, was gifted to Ceylon's House of Representatives in 1949 by the British House of Commons. The mace is composed of a staff of ebony with ornamentation in silver, 18 karat gold and sapphires. 
When the House is in a committee stage, the mace is kept on the lower bracket below the Secretary General's table. It is the Sergeant at Arms who is the custodian of the mace and who maintains the discipline in the House. The business of Parliament is conducted according to the standing orders of the Parliament in the following order. Swearing in of a new member. A new member should be sworn in or affirmed before the Speaker after which his name is entered in the register and he is allocated a seat according to his seniority in Parliament. Communications from the President. Messages from the President on important public matters are sent to Parliament and are read out in the House by the Speaker. Announcements from the Speaker. The most frequent announcements relate to the certification of bills, the demise of a member of Parliament, the reference of bills to provincial councils and so on. Presentation of papers and reports from the committees. Papers may be presented only by the Speaker, a Minister or a Deputy Minister. Committees. A major portion of the work of any legislature is done by its committees. They have been established under the standing orders. While the main chamber of the House is the forum on which public interest is focused, the committee is the place where members attend to the detailed and specialized work relating to government plans and activities. A committee can also meet on any day at the convenience of its members. A committee is also able to summon experts and other relevant witnesses in helping them to arrive at their decisions. Many different committees can function at the same time, whereas in the main assembly only one matter may be taken up at a particular time. The Parliament of Sri Lanka has four types of committees, such as select committees, consultative committees, standing committees and committees for special purposes. Petitions. The public petition enables a citizen to bring to the notice of Parliament the flaws in the administrative machinery of the government and seek redress for grievances suffered. Questions. Questions are notified beforehand and are included in the order paper to be answered by the relevant ministers. Usually about 15 oral questions are answered by government ministers each day. Votes of condolence. By convention, Parliament always passes votes of condolence on the demise of its former members. Motion for leave of absence. Leave is granted to members of Parliament by agreement of the House on a motion. Ministerial statements. Ministers are entitled to make statements on subjects that come within their ministerial responsibility. Personal explanations. Any member against whom criticism or comments of a personal nature have been made is entitled to make a personal explanation even though there is no motion before the House. Questions of privileges. Parliamentary privileges are those attached to Parliament in order to enable it to function freely, effectively and independently without obstruction. For this purpose, the members of Parliament need to be given special rights which other citizens may not claim. Public business. Public business means the orders of the day and motions. It includes bills, motions for the passage of regulations, supplementary estimates and so on. The Constitution vests in the Parliament the primary legislative power to make laws, including laws having retrospective effect and those repealing, adding to or amending any provision of the Constitution itself. All legislative proposals have to be introduced in Parliament in the form of bills. There are different procedures for the passage of different kinds of bills such as government bills, private members bills and urgent bills and so on. A government bill can only be presented by a minister of the cabinet or a deputy minister. They originate with their formulation in a government ministry or department 
and it is referred to the legal draftsman for the preparation of the official draft bill. It is the duty of the Attorney General to examine every bill for any contravention of constitutional provisions. His opinion and the draft bill are then forwarded to the Cabinet of Ministers. Upon receipt of the Cabinet approval, the bill is ready to be published in the Gazette and referred to the Parliament for enactment. Thus, notice is given to the public of the intention to bring the bill before Parliament for its passage into law. At least seven days after the publication in the Gazette, the bill may be placed in the order paper of Parliament and on a day so appointed, it will be presented by the relevant minister. Under Standing Order 45, the second reading of a bill shall be taken up on a date not earlier than a week after the presentation, that's the first reading. The second reading of a bill is the main debate where members express their views on the subject. The second reading should encompass wide-ranging discussions on the principles and scope of the bill. A debate on the second reading would usually last one day, but may extend in some instances to many days. The minister in charge of the bill should introduce the bill and wind up the debate at the end of the second reading. During the second reading, amendments may be proposed. Following the vote on the second reading, a bill may either be referred to the committee of the whole house or to a standing committee on bills. It is almost invariably the practice for government bills to be committed to a committee of the whole house because a bill can be passed more expeditiously in such a committee. The third reading of a bill is for the approval of the overall contents of the bill with the committee stage amendments and at this stage only verbal or drafting amendments and numbering of sections and so on may be done and that too on a motion made. It is usual for the minister at the third reading to seek the approval of the House to make consequential amendments. At the stage of certification, the bill should be prepared in strict compliance with the amendments accepted by the House at the committee stage. The Speaker has the power at this stage to correct printing, typographical or grammatical errors, but not to introduce any substantial deviation from the clauses approved by the House. Basic rules relating to debating in the Parliament is that a member who speaks should do so standing and should address his words to the chair. He can only be interrupted if he gives way. He is, however, bound to give way if a point of order is raised. While presiding in the House, often the Speaker has to rule whether words or phrases used in the heat of debate are unparliamentary. If they are, he orders the offending member to withdraw the words or that they may be expunged from the Hansard. Sometimes the speaker may feign deafness. The Parliament has a well-equipped library which is exclusively used by members of Parliament. The stock held by the library includes books, periodicals, newspapers and reference material on subjects such as law, political, history, economic and social sciences and so on. The monograph collection in the library numbers nearly 15,000. Parliamentary debates or hansards, legal enactments, acts and bills of Sri Lanka, government gazettes, parliamentary series, sessional papers, administrative reports and annual reports are some of the documents in the preserved collection. It also has a good collection of very valuable rare books and documents on Sri Lanka, such as oaths and affirmations by members of parliament. The library is automated and is equipped with communication and internet facilities. The most important record kept in Parliament is the Hansard, which is a faithful reproduction of the proceedings in the House. The speeches in the Hansard are recorded in the language in which they are delivered. Speeches are also recorded on audio tape and on DVD. The business of Parliament is conducted in Sinhala, in Tamil and English languages and simultaneous interpretation is available during debates into all three languages. Members of Parliament have the option to select a language of their choice, which can be heard over a headphone and it is an indispensable service of the House. There are many colourful ceremonies attached to the Parliament. The most colourful 
is the inauguration of a new session of parliament when the president drives into the parliament complex in an atmosphere of ceremonial grandeur and pageantry. Another colorful event in parliament is the budget speech in which the finance minister unfolds his budgetary plans for the following year. Addresses to parliamentarians by visiting dignitaries are also special events in Parliament. The Parliament website is available at www.parliament.lk. This site provides relevant information to the members of Parliament, the Secretariat and the general public. It has increased the accessibility of the parliamentary information to its stakeholders.